In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to study St. John Paul II's writings, um, audience by audience, and the theology of the body. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to us to help us understand this call to celibacy for the kingdom that Jesus introduced to um, his disciples. Lord, help us to understand as well. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay. So we are on this section of celibacy for the kingdom of heaven. Um, this is at the tail end of part one of Theology of the Body. So we've, we've, we've looked at an adequate anthropology so far, an anthropology of what does it mean to be human based on sacred scripture, based on the triptych, the three words of Christ, when he appeals to the beginning, to the human heart, and to the resurrection. And this is an anthropology. Um, and it leads us at the very end, he, he discusses a, a, meth, a mode of living, one of the states of life, a vocation to celibacy. So th this is one way, after we know our anthropology, our identity, who we are, then how do you live? How do you live out that identity? Well, one of the pathways that Christ opens up is celibacy for the kingdom of heaven. So we have several audiences on this topic. Um, so we're looking at them one at a time. So that privilege given to celibacy and virginity for the kingdom of for the kingdom was an absolute novelty in comparison with the tradition of the old wait i'm on the wrong one Just a second sorry here we go audience number 77 when he proclaims continence for the kingdom of heaven christ fully accepts all that the creator wrought and instituted from the beginning so when Jesus introduces this new thing to the apostles, this celibacy that someone can choose voluntarily, this is, you know, the Old Testament, they, they had this high regard for marriage and procreation uh, and fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and for awaiting the Messiah. Um, that when Christ proclaims this kingdom of heaven, he accepts all that the creator had wrought and instituted from the beginning. So this, re this refers us back to chapter one of Theology of the Body, when Christ appealed to the beginning. And John Paul II looked, what is this beginning? It's what Genesis speaks about. It's chapter one and chapter two of Genesis, the creation accounts. Um, and then it also discusses the fall, you know, chapter three, um, and onto our history. But when, so when, when Jesus brings up this topic of celibacy, he fully has in mind all that God, the creator, intended for masculinity and femininity, and all that God intended for marriage, this great good of marriage that God had created. Christ had this in mind when he spoke about celibacy. That which in the call to continence for the kingdom of heaven is an invitation to solitude for God. So yes, it is that the celibacy is connected with solitude for God, being alone, set apart for God, for prayer. But it respects at the same time, both the dual nature of humanity, that is, its masculinity and femininity, and also that dimension of the communion of existence that is proper to the person. So while celibacy is being alone in a certain sense, it's going back to that original solitude in a certain sense, a connection with that, that man was alone before God. He still had a relationship with God. So this being celibate for God is one thing, but the person, human person who chooses celibacy, a man or a woman, is also a part of humanity as a man or a woman. It has this nature that is towards communion. Philosophers say we have a social nature. We're meant to form this communion of persons in society. Um, and so the celibate also has this part of his humanity or her humanity. He is able to discover in this solitude of his, which never ceases to be a personal dimension of everyone's dual nature, 
a new and even fuller form of intersubjective communion with others. So he says, he actually says something very bold here that the celibate actually can enter into a fuller form of intersubjective communion than through marriage. So in a, in a way he can enter into this communion of persons with, with many others as a celibate because he's also living totally for God and for this communion of saints, this intersubjective community. Continence means a conscious and voluntary renunciation of marriage, this union, speaking of marriage, and all that is connected with it in the full dimension of human life and the sharing of life. So because Christ is aware of the great good of marriage that God had created <coughs> in the beginning, that this continence is a somehow a renunciation of this great good for this other value. So you're saying no to one thing. There is a sacrifice. There's some sort of sacrifice that the celibate takes up by, by sacrificing this great good. That's part of their nature. Part of our nature is to be inclined masculinity towards femininity and femininity towards masculinity. So the celibate is somehow uh, escaping this or getting out of this like um, great good that is a noble and natural desire. Um, yeah, he understands the importance of this renunciation. So Christ understands this renunciation of marriage and how hard it is. He, you know, he lived it himself. Um, you know, Mary and Joseph lived celibate as well uh, and while being married. <laughs> yeah. Um, he understood the importance of this renunciation also in relation to the good that marriage and the family constitute in themselves because of their divine institution. So because God created marriage in the family, it's really good. Um, and so by, he's going to talk about the superiority of celibacy over marriage in the church's tradition and how this can only be understood rightly if one does never denounces the great good of marriage the church does, has no form of manichaeism that would see the body is bad or sexuality is bad but it sees marriage and sexuality as a great good he says that behind the words of matthew both in 19 chapter 19, 11 through 12, and in chapter 5, 27 to 28, one finds the same anthropology and the same ethos. Um, so we're talking about the same human person, the same anthropology in both this chapter 5, 27 to 28, was that, well, that was Christ's call to purity of heart, that we can't even lust, that is committing adultery in the heart when you look at a woman with desire. Um, and chapter 19 is about celibacy. So it's the same human person that Christ is referring to in both cases. And John Paul II is really realistic in the sense that he understands our human condition. And, and Christ understood that too, when he made this call to celibacy, that we are living in this historical state that after the fall, and it includes our fallen and redeemed nature, it is precisely this man this historical man in whom there remains at one and the same time the heritage of the threefold concupiscence. So we inherit this threefold concupiscence as a result of the fall, the heritage of sin, as well as the heritage of redemption. It is this man who makes the decision about continence for the kingdom of heaven. So it is this man, this one who has inherited this concupiscence, sin, and redemption that chooses continence. Um, he must make this decision by subordinating the sinfulness of his own humanity to the powers that flow from the mystery of the redemption of the body. So I think this is like a realism of John Paul II that he realizes our, our sinful nature, inclination, that as, as a result of the fall, that we've inherited this original sin. But he also sees the reality of holiness, the reality of the power of, of hope, that there's hope for us, that we can submit ourselves, our body, to the power of the redemption. In the, so he, now he's going to talk about the superiority of 
continence. He said he asked the question to start out in his statement, does Christ highlight the superiority of continence for the kingdom of heaven? Does Jesus do this when he speaks in Matthew 19 about celibacy? Does he say that celibacy is higher than marriage? He says that Jesus only indirect, it can only be said that Jesus indirectly says that, but not directly. Jesus does not directly say that celibacy is higher than marriage. However, Paul, St. Paul does directly say it. He says about those who choose marriage that they do well, and that those who are willing to live in voluntary continence that they do better. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And it's just clarifying the church's traditional teaching in this area that the super superiority of continence to marriage never means in the authentic tradition of the church a disparagement of marriage or a belittling of its essential value. The evangelical and genuinely Christian superiority of virginity of continence is thus dictated by the motive of the kingdom of heaven. So virginity or continence is, is objectively higher than marriage because of the motive for the kingdom of heaven, that they're doing this for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and that they're, object, they're, they're making themselves set apart for God alone. A couple of announcements. We have two more retreats coming up. Um, one in Pittsburgh in May, at the, towards the end of May. And the other one, uh, God willing, in Mexico City in June. Um, so you're welcome to put those, mark your calendars and get ready for a good time. <laughs> Okay, so um, what are your thoughts or questions or reactions to this audience about celibacy? So only St. Paul said that continence for the kingdom is higher than marriage. Yeah, he, well, he says that Jesus, you could say that Jesus spoke about it like indirectly, indirectly, but not directly. So Jesus didn't say it, but you could say he referenced it in a way. Uh, but Paul does say it directly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you think that he's getting at um, when he, when John Paul talks about um, the sacrifice? We in our society tend to go to uh, okay, well you're sacrificing the uh, the marital embrace, sexual activity. But I don't think that's what he's getting at primarily. I think he's, I, I wonder what you, what you all think, if it's more along the lines of you're sacrificing this essential structure of yourself to be deeply united with somebody of the opposite sex. And by, by doing that, you're open then to what God's will is for you in, you know, this, this celibacy. Um, it, seemed, it seems like he's dealing more with the depth of that type of relationship, you know, all the aspects that you're sacrificing in that situation to be open to a whole different set of relationships. Yeah, I think that's a good good point, Bob. Like in our in our cult in the U.S., we you you often hear, oh, but that if someone chooses celibacy, oh, that means you can't have sex ever. But I think it's it's true what what you're saying that like John Paul could be thinking of, you know, not just the sexual embrace, but the all the aspects of living, um, in, in marriage, male and female living this life of unity, um. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a, there's more to sacrifice than only sexual intercourse, but this whole life of 
of marriage, right? This whole common life of male and female living together. Oh, Nick, you're muted. One thing I found interesting, and I'm not sure I totally agree with, towards the end, he indicates that one of the benefits is that a celibate can have a better communion with person than a non-celibate. But I'm not sure because a, a non-celibate, especially in a marriage, that's flesh of my flesh. That is the, the spousal union that is of a very high order and is very useful in, in hopefully marching to the kingdom together as man and wife. Now, his point that a celibate can have a very deep relationship with someone else, a non-celibate, is, is useful. But when you look at numbers, that there aren't a lot of celibates to go around to have communion of persons with. Do you see my point? I mean, he tries to make a big deal of father confessor and a, a priest in confession, that those are very deep communion of persons relationships, which is true, but it's almost like, therefore, you're discounting that spousal relationship that married persons have. I don't know. Kind of how I understood it. It was like a celibate person um, is not married to any one person and therefore he or she is free to be almost like a brother or a sister to like everybody, you know, like well, even more than a brother or sister sort of to have, I don't know, it sort of opens them up to relationships with, with many different people. Um, as a celibate person, because if you're married, you're kind of focused, like you have to stay very focused on your one, your spouse, right? And you have to really give that relationship total commitment and focus. And that sort of doesn't allow you to maybe as branch out as much as a celibate could. That's how I read it. Yeah. I think that's what he said um, was the fuel and the research and the experience for this teaching. You know, you showed pictures of him on his uh, trips out in the wilderness. Um, so, you know, taking a group of uh, people, young people, couples, and so forth, and going out in the wilderness and, you know, uh, getting a fire together, cooking, spending time in community, kind of away from other distractions. And he was using this opportunity, he, he utilized the opportunity to learn about people's relationships with each other, how they really related and what they struggled with. And it was a very humble thing. It was not along the lines of, here I am the priest telling you, hey, you know, here's how you should behave. No, actually he was asking them, how does this work for you? How, how do you address these things? How do you deal with these things? Well, you know, and he, and he learned and listened. Um, so that's a very relational kind of attitude. And I think he got a lot of his experience to write this teaching from that, that situation.
I kind of agree, but that also leads you to the to the answer to the question: For a priest to be a good marriage counselor, he has to have lots of relationships with married couples to get to that level of understanding to be a good counselor since he is a celibate and not personally involved in those kinds of spousal relationships that he's going to have to discuss with members of his parish. And that, that's kind of the, the other way of the street where in, in matters of faith, not spousal relationships, it's possible that a priest or a religious or a consecrated woman could be in a much better position to counsel, to be in communion with a married person or persons. I just see it not quite as black and white as it came across in 77. I guess one question I'd ask, he makes a statement that a, a, there, is, um, there is a superiority of the celibate who, because they have a fuller form of inter-objective inter communion with others. And I'm not sure that's a decent blanket statement that automatically a celibate has a fuller form of interpersonal, inter subjective communion with others. I think anybody could have a fuller form of intersubjective communi communicate, communion with others based on their relationship with the Holy Spirit, based on their background, based on all kinds of things. Yeah, I think, I think he's just comparing the, the two states of life, like the the celibate, the celibate state of life, and the married, the married state of life, um, and looking at those two states, because the celibate, um, because of his celibacy or her celibacy, they are more free or more able. I don't know somehow to make a gift of themselves to many people he says uh, at the end of section two uh, when he chooses continence for the kingdom of heaven man has the awareness that in this way he can realize himself differently so it is different it is celibacy is different than marriage um, and in some sense more than in marriage by becoming a sincere gift for others so i think you know we know marriage marriage is also a sincere gift um, to each other, yeah, to each other, to their family, you know, to their kids. Um, so yet they're complete, yeah, both vocations are all about communion with others. And, you know, they're both totally about that. Like, that's the whole purpose of life, right? I mean, is this communion and this love. But I guess it's just looking at the difference between celibacy and marriage and kind of how do they do communion? You know, because marriage does communion this way, like with the family, but also with others too, you know, you know, marriage has relationships outside of the spouse, but their primary relationship is um, their spouse, but a celibate, they don't really have that. Well, that they do, if they live in a religious community, then their kind of main group is that religious community, but their, their main spouse is God. Um, so it leads to a sort, sort of a different way of relating with others, I think, too. To some extent. Hey, hi, Delia. Welcome. Hi, Nick. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I'm late. You know, I was teaching. Yes, awesome. Glad you're here. Thank you. We're, ju we're just speaking about celibacy um, for the kingdom of heaven and comparing it to marriage. Well, um, having been married, what, 
But the experience I had was you, you learn a great deal about the other person and, and also your reaction to the other person. Um, and really there's a commonality of, you know, married people and how they interact. There are circumstances and situations that have a lot of commonality. But what I noticed is that there's also a lot of difference. There's a lot of difference because of the nature of the other person and the nature of my relationship that, that I have. So there are a lot of times that a lot of other married people can't relate to my experience. It doesn't, it, does, it wasn't even close to theirs or it wasn't in the same universe as theirs. It was quite different. And there's where the advantage of the celibate comes in because, you know, um, as Nick, you pointed out, there, a lot of times people will go to their priest and talk about the difficulties they're having in their marriage. And, they, and the person may not be qualified for marriage counseling, of course, but they very well might bring up the, the area and then the priest would, you know, would say, well, I'll refer you to, you know, marriage counseling. Here's this marriage counseling. But, but he's going to have to hear what the issues are first and how, you know, you're dealing with it and have kind of a sensitivity to, you know, how bad it is. <laughs> so um, my point is, is that you're, you're having a very intense experience, but with one other person. And then there's a dynamic in that relationship that's peculiar to that relationship. So it doesn't necessarily tell you, yep, I can relate to everybody else who's been married um, because of the differences that occur. So. Bob, if I could go back to what you said earlier about um, sacrifice, you know, um, at the end or at the in section three, he's talking about he says when you know that mar marriage is a good and that the celibate freely chooses to break away from this good, from at the very bottom of page four twenty seven. He's breaking away from the circle of the good, but he does this for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So he has a value. She has a value that they're, they're going towards. Um, so it's a certain self-sacrifice. And then he goes on to say um, that this break also becomes the beginning. And then on the next page of further renunciations and voluntary self-sacrifices that are indispensable if the first and fundamental choice is to be consistent in the breadth of one's entire earthly life. Um, hey, Bernadette, welcome. <laughs> so it's like there's one that, you know, the major, the one major sacrifice he's, he's admitting, and he said earlier that Christ was aware of the travail that would happen when someone chooses this. Like this, this life is a sacrifice. And he's like the celibate life is a sacrifice. Um, and he says that there's further renunciations and voluntary self-sacrifice. So not celibacy, but other, you know, other self-sacrifices that kind of go hand in hand with this, that is sort of a life of sacrifice as Christ. And then he says in section four, that this is a participation in the redemption. This is the celibate share in the redemption that they've chosen this path, this mode of self-gift, <laughs> self-sacrifice that that enables them to participate in this redemption of Christ. So could that be reflected in, in the events around the passion? What do you mean? So Jesus was um, alone 
in the sense of the marital bonds, right? And he had the 12 with him. Um, but when it really came down to it, it was only his mother and uh, John and um, a, couple, a few other people who actually hung with him through the whole thing. And, you know, you think about our lives and you think about one of the wonderful purposes, one of the wonderful beauties of marriage is that in any situation, any circumstance, the partner is there for you, right? That, that's, the, that's one of the ideals of it that you're both supposed to be living up to. Whenever you're in a rough spot, difficult situation, need somebody to bail you out of jail, <laughs> any number of things, right? It's your spouse that steps up to the plate there. Um, but he foregoes that. And yet, you know, his mother was still there, which was a pivotal, pivotal role. But he is, he says to people along the way, you know, I've really got nowhere to lay my head. You know, I'm just traveling around here. There's no palace for me. He doesn't use that word, but, you know, I, I'm wondering if in the passion, you kind of see that, that aloneness, that him being alone is kind of brought out and that suffering is kind of amplified because of the betrayal and the running away of everybody and, and uh, you know, that whole nature. What, what do you think? I, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I can't really come, maybe other people could comment more on your statement. Um, I just think of the psalm, the psalm that says, my one companion is darkness. Um, and that's often referred to, to Christ. Pray, you know, he prayed that the beginning of the psalm, oh, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He even felt abandoned by, by God the Father, you know, or he, he prayed that psalm. You know, I'm sure he, he was trusting God, God was with him, but he, at this, at this moment of, of his death, like giving up his life, he just gave it all, you know, um, he felt abandoned or he prayed that psalm of abandonment. Um, and then I think it's the same song. It might be a different song, but it ends with, uh, my one companion is darkness. Um, and I just think of that aloneness and, you know, Christ was alone when, you know, Peter denied him, Peter denied him three times. And then he was alone in the prison that night, um, you know, awaiting the, his, um, sentence and, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of solitude there, I think, and a lot of suffering. But there were at least there was his mother and you know John, and the other women that were there. Um, that's great. And I think, as Ed said, you know, the three who were there at the cross, you know, John was the apostle best loved by Jesus. His mother, of course, and Mary Magdalene, who from the very beginning was a total supporter. Uh, one of the hardest workers in ensuring that the 12 ate and had places to stay. So as a celibate, he had three individuals, one family and, and two others who stood by him and loved him to the very end. So I'm, I'm not sure we should take celibates and move them to a position of loneliness and being alone. And, and <laughs> I, I think that's sad. I think we, in some cases, what's happened in our society and in our church is doing that if we're not careful and we're not bringing priests into a dialogue with families and couples so that they understand those things as opposed to pushing them off because there's this fear factor. Nick, I wanted to ask something. I want to, to be like, like to spark a complicated discussion or anything, but I think I've never understand, understood completely why, why St. Paul can make us feel as if choosing marriage were the least option. 
I think Nick Grant understands what I'm saying. I see you nodding. Do you, do you understand why, why I'm asking this? I, I said I this before you came on. I oh, raised sorry. this as an issue that oh. it's, it's what's confusing about 77. I mean, I think they're both important and I don't like it, whether it was Paul or, or, or John Paul, to put them in, a, in an order of one higher than the other. They are both wonderful ways to live and they are different. They are different callings, but who's to say one calling is better than another calling? I, I, it bothers me a little. Yes, it's the same, the same with me. And I don't know if I need to understand St. Paul from, from his cultural context or from his personal history. Of course, I need a lot of information, but from the little information I have, I get this feeling like, why, why making it like, a, like the less bad option? I think it's a less good option. Oh, yeah. But why? Yeah. Why making because it look like that? I think, so this is my understanding, you know, and I, this is my understanding of the church's teaching too, that, you know, he even says this is the traditional teaching of the church, that, that first of all, by saying that continence is superior, like the, the title of this section is the right understanding of the superiority of continence for the kingdom of heaven. So we have to understand it rightly. He says one way that is wrongly is that to say that this means marriage is bad. This by no, by saying celibacy is higher or better in no way says that marriage is less. So if there is a, a hierarchy of goods, if you could choose a type of car that was like really good, or you could choose a car that was good. You know, which would you choose? The really good car or like there's a level or a something like, what's another example? There's just a level like a, you know, on my Zoom account, I can get the highest level, the pro level, or I can get the, the this level, or I can get this level. Um, so this is an objective, objective level. And he says celibacy is objectively higher good because it's choosing God for your spouse. But he, he also says that love is the measure. Love is the measure. So someone in marriage who is, is living a holy life can be holier than someone that's living in the objective. Uh, so objectively, this is the, the state, but subjectively, someone in marriage can be much holier, much happier than someone living in this other state. Because it's all about love. It's the amount of love that you have. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that not sit well? <laughs> I like that. The the just what you just explained about love being the measure that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And everybody has the right vocation for them, so not everybody is called to that that state of life. Um, and marriage is also a path to holiness and happiness. <laughs> it, it can become confusing also in our culture and how our culture has influenced us, which was also influencing the Jewish culture, because again, if Jesus is the model that John Paul keeps referring to, he got down on his knees and washed their feet. And then he made a very clear point, right? If I, who am teacher, do this for you, then this is how you are to do with each other. Um, drawing a clear distinction with, you know that they lord it over them when you are in the world. So whatever authority or however he's trying to indicate that there's a calling for continents, that only means they have more responsibility to serve 
greater people and more deeply and more fully, not to lord it over. <clears throat> Yeah, I just looked ahead. In the next audience, he says, we're, we're still in this section. So we're going to continue to talk about this topic of the right, it's called the right understanding of superiority of content. So maybe we'll get more insight as we go on. Um, but I see in the next audience, he does say the perfection of Christian life is measured by the measure of love. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get more into this. Yeah. Isn't also part of the context that marriage is the, as Christopher West says, the primordial sacrament, the first. That's for everybody, not everybody. <laughs> and so then this is a, Jesus instituted a new understanding of marriage, both the state of what is going to occur between a man and a woman and what this state that he showed he demonstrated of continents for the kingdom so you can have marriage or you can have a different kind of marriage, celibacy. They're both marriage. It just one's with another human. Well, well and one's with God. Okay. Okay, thank you. Some may remember this, this goes back to a point I made very early when, when I was confused as we were talking about marriage and Adam and Eve and, and all that. And I asked the question, I said, as a teacher, especially of youngsters, it's very difficult to use scripture, New Testament scripture to identify what I'll call a normal family. And a number of you challenged me and said, well, what about Jesus and Mary and Joseph? And based on what we've now read, that is not a normal family. You don't have a normal family running around with them all being celibate, okay? So, so then you, you really struggle, you know, Priscilla and Aquila, some of the other couples, there's not enough detail to focus on a scriptural, New Testament married couple. I mean, Peter ran off and left his wife and kids and, you know, not sure how he took care of them. And, and there are more examples of dysfunctional marriages and families than there are what I would hope there to be. Let's now do a study of, you know, Susanna and uh, John, not real people, because I don't have a really good example to go to in New Testament scripture. I remember when you made that question, and I suppose you kept on doing research. What, a, what about the book of Acts? Did you find something? I mean, there are, there are some strange examples. I mean, you end up with Cornelius and his family and his wife, but, but they're, not, they're not the kind of thing you could easily put into, let, let's have a class now and we're going to look at this, this family who is an example of a family doing, doing Jesus's will today, back in the first century. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I mean, we, we can deal with it. And I think we deal with it with saints, with married saints, mm -hmm. but we're kind of forced into that because we, we may have the greatest example of celibacy with Jesus, but we don't necessarily have a great example of a married couple. And if somebody Zechariah, has one, go ahead. Zechariah and yeah, Isabel, I looked at that. Yeah, I mean, and and them, and also um, Mary's sister. Yes, 
but th there's not enough detail to really tell a story. You know, they're, they're in just for a brief snapshot, not a life. Anyway, that's just something that, and, and this reinforced that when we came back now to celibacy, where's the example of the married folks? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep looking only because I get asked this a lot by the um, children's faith formation folks. Mm -hmm. And as they've gotten linked into theology of the body, it's kind of made it more difficult to talk about Mary and Joseph with the older children. There's something in what you said that I don't know, but it sort of, sort of gives me consolation. And you just said that some were dysfunctional and I sometimes get frustrated, you know, like last week I had a difficulty with my husband and then I took it on my kids and, you know, and then you get all discouraged and think you're doing everything wrong. And then, but then I think, well, all families are dysfunctional in some ways, no family is perfect. So maybe if even some families in the New Testament had their struggles, you know, and they're, I, I don't understand either why Peter left his wife. It's something I've always thought about. But well, mm -hmm. then I think if they accomplished a mission and were so close to Jesus and, and maybe were not perfect families or perfect marriages, then maybe I can do the same, you know? <laughs> And, and maybe you're right, maybe that is the message. When we look there, we see nothing much has changed. There are the same problems today that there were then. Which in, in the my chosen, mind, oh, I was just gonna say, which in my mind would make marriage the more difficult, the more suffering and the higher order than that of the celibate. Yeah. Okay. The suffering part of marriage, right? The wedding, what's it? The three rings of, of marriage? Yeah, the three rings. <laughs> what's that? I forgot There's what they were. I the rings. wedding ring, the... The engagement ring. Or... And, and the suffering. The three <laughs> rings. <laughs> yeah. um, Christopher West made an interesting point about this functional family that the two terms are redundant. Uh, uh, saying dysfunctional family is redundant because every family is really dysfunctional to some extent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that gave me consolation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we, we do, you know, I'm thinking of the Old Testament too. I, I just heard recently, uh, was it Moses or was it Joshua who said, as for me and my household, we will Joshua. serve the, Joshua. Yeah. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So he, he like as the father is saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna serve the Lord. We don't see the details of that, you know, but you see that commitment. Um, and that you can imagine what it would be like, I guess. But also like I'm think, you know, and we do see a lot of dysfunction of families throughout the old testament, a lot of things happening, but um, you also see really amazing love stories like the Song of Songs, you know, this, this love poetry between the, the groom and the bride. So you, see, so you see some great examples of love there. Um, and then you, we don't see the detail. Well, you see some details of Mary and Joseph, like their, their celibate marriage, their, their communion. You see Joseph protecting his family. You see him um, taking them to Egypt and um, you know, escaping Herod. So um, you see, you see good examples. And in the Acts, there's one family who had their whole household baptized, like he and his household were baptized. So you see like little snippets there, but I agree there's not like a full story of a family type of thing. But maybe that's just not what the authors of those, of the scripture, the, you know, the inspired authors, God's word, um, we're, we're just not writing that because like a lot of the new Testament is letters of St. Paul. So he, 
he will talk about family life from time to time. You know, he'll talk about the virtues of uh, children towards their parents and parents towards their children, you know, in a letter, but that's not the whole focus of the letter. Um, but he will mention how to be mm -hmm. Christian families. Um, and then I guess the gospels, you know, they're focused on Jesus's life and Jesus, they're focused on Jesus. Yeah. And, um, and you see Jesus encountering different families from time to time, you know, like uh, the mother-in-law of Peter um, that he healed and then she served him. And so that, that's another question I wanted to bring up at some point. We could talk about when I was in seminary, we read a book about the history of celibacy in the church. Um, and it all begins with like the first, the apostles, you know, so were they married? Like, was Peter, you know, that's, this is the question. Were they, were they married? And then when Jesus called them to follow him, did they leave their spouse? Um, or how was that? Because Peter had a mother-in-law. That means he was married, right? Uh-huh. Um, so like when they were followed, like they, you know, maybe their families didn't live far away. So maybe their spouse was still uh, close, but that's just a question I I always wonder, you know, like when did celibacy start in the, you know, when did people start to imitate Jesus's celibacy? Did you see the chosen? Some of them. There's an episode of the chosen um, where Simon Peter his wife says, oh, go, go. I'm telling you, go. Oh my gosh, go. It's Jesus. I'll be fine. I've got my mother here. You know, go. And I think that's because she really admired Jesus and everyone did. Well, <laughs> not everyone, but she really admired Jesus. So she told him, go, follow him, go. Yeah. yeah, there's so much we don't know. Mm -hmm. no. Yes, but from what you just said, Nick, about when did celibacy start and that, there's also this letter from St. Paul where the, of recommendations to the bishops where he says that it's better if it's someone married just once. <laughs> and that was like the desirable state. Remember that letter? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yes, he doesn't speak about celibacy still. Well, he did, but we understand that there were most bishops were married, right? Yes. In fact, celibacy did not become a doctrine of the church until the council in either 213 or 253, somewhere around there, just either before or after Constantine. Before that time, priests and bishops were married. There were several things that uh, it took several hundred years for the church to get a handle on or get some clarity on just the perspective. Right. And, and in fact, the, the, the real argument at the council dealt with, the, uh, with how bishops' inheritances went to their children. That turned out, that turned out to be the big issue that resulted in the, the doctrine of the church being no, no children, no marriage. Unfortunately, some people throw that up as saying that's the only reason that they're celibacy. And I think that we're seeing there's a lot more to it. It certainly evolved over time. Okay, well, I think we're about out of time. Anybody have anything else from, from this audience? Yeah, 
you know, I think, I think a lot of this topic is, is good for, for seminarians and religious and, and priests um, to know about, you know, to study because he gives some, some great arguments for celibacy and about, about it. So I think it would be important to encourage, you know, priests to, to read this section. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, all right, well, let's close in prayer. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word and sacred scripture to us and the example of Jesus and in the lives of the saints and the apostles. Um, we ask you to send us grace, Lord, to live out our vocation to its full, to the maximum, to, to love as completely as possible in our own, in our own lives. Um, we pray We pray for all those who have chosen the, the life of celibacy, Lord, that you would be with them, help them to enter, first of all, into relationship with you, Lord, as their, as their spouse, and, and also to have good, healthy relationships with one another, with other people. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.